In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So today is Pentecost, and we've heard the stories of how on this day, 50 days after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit descended upon a group of scared people in a small, fairly small room. Couldn't be that small, it was about 120 of them. But in a room in Jerusalem, and the sound of a great wind, and then flames like, or tongues like flame, and they began speaking in foreign languages and spilled out onto the street. And that, we heard the beginning of Peter's sermon, which was supposedly so effective that 3,000 people were baptized that day. And hence, we, also why we call it the birthday of the church, because after that, we really had a church. But our relationship with the Holy Spirit and how we approach Pentecost has changed uh, uh, from time to time over the years. And for the longest time, we kind of squelched it as much as we possibly could. Uh, we knew there was a Holy Spirit, we just didn't want it, the Spirit to do much of anything because it got us in trouble. That, I think, came mostly from Europe's experience of the religious wars that followed the Reformation, where people were killing each other because they were so extreme in their, um, in their religious views. And so, um, especially the Church of England opted for a, a very quiet and mature faith where no one ever got it excited about anything. <laughs> the big change happened a little over a hundred years ago. It was the Azusa Street Revival, which did not happen in an Anglican or Episcopal church, but it happened in Los Angeles. And this was the beginning of Pentecostalism, where we began to see uh, on, a, on a broad brace basis the, the, the kind of uh, charismatic gifts like were what was described in the book of Acts. Uh, and from that, it began to spread into new denominations, Pentecostal churches, and then into, also into mainline denominations. Um, it hit the Episcopal Church starting in the 60s. And uh, by the 80s, when I was um, thinking about and then going to seminary and then getting ordained, it was becoming quite controversial. Um, how do we deal with the Holy Spirit and especially people who are seeking charismatic gifts and expressions like that, how do we deal with that? Uh, and in some places it got very divisive. I, <clears throat> when I came to this diocese, it was to be rector of Shepherd of the Hills Episcopal Church in Branson, and when I came I already knew that there was a smoldering war going on between the charismatic faction in the church and the quote traditionalist faction. I went out of my way to be there on my first Sunday on Pentecost to try to, to um, end the problem or at least deal with it. I'd love to say I was fantastically successful but or not really. Um, what I tried to do was was to let everybody know, I mean, this is my basic, it's still basic message, everyone is both charismatic, because that means gifted, and we're all gifted by God, and everyone is traditional, because we're all carrying on the tradition of the apostles that started back at that first Pentecost almost 2,000 years ago. But style makes differences in how people approach things. And my experience in Branson was as I tried to... Um, tried to find ways to allow the charismatic people to have an expression that they really wanted to have, it never quite worked out right. Um, we started a Sunday evening service where they could really let go because it didn't conflict with what we did on Sunday mornings. Um, and it was my, my daughter who was about five years old at the time, very prescient. She, we came out from it and she said, it's the dueling prayer wars. <laughs> And what was going on was that we had people actually trying to shout out their, their prayers over each other to, I don't know, just one of these. And it was kind of a, uh, we came to realize that, that uh, uh, something else was going on as well. Now, if you think it was a new thing that had never happened before, go back and read Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, especially chapter 14. 
And what you'll find is this is exactly what was going on in Corinth while he wrote the, the letter, that people were, were trying to do one-upsmanship on with each other all the time, and they were shouting out in, in, in tongues that no one could understand, and it was just a cacophony when they were in worship, and no one got much of anything out of it. And Paul basically wrote that letter to straighten them out and that they needed to what if they needed to always have in mind that what was most important was the building up of the church and the and the growth of the gospel of Jesus Christ what i found with some people who got got into the pentecostalism is an intractability uh, of, I know I'm doing it right, so therefore you must be doing it wrong. You have to do it my way. Um, and that got difficult. It's kind of like the story of, <clears throat> of the frog in the potholes. Any of you ever heard the story of the frog in the pothole? Well, I guess I'll have to tell it. Frog is hopping down the road at night and hops into a deep pothole and then can't get out. He tries to jump out of the pothole, and he just can't get back up to the top of it. And the frog is terrified, because he hears cars going by. And he's terrified at some point a car is going to hit that pothole and squish him. And he's terrified. For a while, it's OK. The cars pass by. But then he hears this truck coming, and the truck is bearing down. He can tell the truck is not going to swerve. The truck is going to go right into the pothole. And as it got closer and closer and he could hear it coming, he got more and more terrified. And finally, he yells to himself, Jesus Christ, I've got to get out of here. And he leapt clear of the pothole just in time. So now what does the frog do? The frog sits on the side of the road. And whenever another frog goes hopping by, he pushes him into the pothole. Why? Well, that's how he found Jesus. He figures out that's how everybody has to do it. <clears throat> So, <clears throat> we can learn some lessons from the stories in Acts, including the one today, about how the Holy Spirit actually works. When you see the Holy Spirit working in the church, it's never the Spirit is never just working in one individual. Never, ever. It, the Spirit appears in community. It creates community. The Spirit builds community. So anytime we get a situation where people think that they've got somehow the right spirit and the other people have the wrong spirit, about the only thing you can say is the person who thinks she or he is right and everybody else is wrong has probably got a different spirit than the Holy Spirit, at least in this case. The spirit builds community. The spirit draws the people together. The spirit gives us the gifts and the ability <clears throat> to do the work of Christ. And if that's not happening, then somehow we've missed what the Spirit is supposed to be doing. And it's not a Spirit that says there's only one way to do it. Think about what Paul said in the letter of the Romans you heard today. He says, you have not received a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you've received a spirit of adoption. You've been set free in Christ to follow, and you're, you're free as a child of God and an heir. That is, you have complete equality with Christ and everything else. We do. Which means, among other things, that the Holy Spirit, <coughs> excuse me, respects our minds and respects our own human free will and dignity. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Therefore, Spirit never makes us do things that we don't want to do. The Spirit encourages us, enlightens us, helps us, empowers us, but it's always an act of cooperation between us and God through the Spirit. <coughs> so we should not need to be afraid of the Spirit. For it's not going to make us embarrassed like we, I was always afraid that I would pass out in a service and fall down and look like an idiot. And spirit doesn't do that sort of thing. Spirit respects us, the Spirit works with us, the Spirit loves us, the Spirit respects our minds and everything else. The main point about all of this rambling is that 
the Holy Spirit is still active in the church, just as active in the church today as the Spirit was 2,000 years ago. And he's still calling us into ministry and he's still gifting us to do things. And there's not any one way we have to do it. But if we work together and pray together and be and with the confidence and hope that the Spirit will give us what we need when we need it, then we know that we will be able to do our ministry and that our ministry will make some lasting effect on the world. Whether there's 10 of us, 100 of us, 2 of us, if we're acting together, expecting the Spirit's help and power, the gospel is going to be told and lived, and the world will be changed. Amen.